is Brianna Clark. And growing up, I was always known as the sick kid. It's kind of a side effect of having a chronic condition, in my case, a chronic heart condition. But in sophomore year, I got promoted, and I became the dying kid. And this landed me a position in a hospital bed at UCSF for nearly a month. And during this time, I had many visitors, ranging from both friends and family, including my oldest brother, Lars. Now at the time, Lars was living in Boston, going to grad school, and he had a lot on his plate, so I really wasn't expecting him to come see me. But he called my mom to ask and see how I was doing, and he asked a question that no mother ever deserves to hear about her child, and no brother deserves to ask about her, his younger sister. Is she going to make it? My mother could only respond with, I don't know. So he took the first flight out to San Francisco to see me for what could have been the last time. Is she going to make it? It's such a despairing question. What he was really asking was how much time does she have left? How much time does she have before there's no more time left to see her? And the, the answer, of course, would have remained the same. I don't know. Because none of us really know how much time we have left. But when we are faced with death, whether it be our own or of someone close to us, we become undeniably aware of time. But I have found that this isn't a bad thing. Being aware of time actually has a lot of benefits, including um, being, establishing a healthy mindset, establishing an identity, establishing morality, and establishing connection. As far as establishing a healthy mindset, well, if we want to know what establishes a healthy mindset, we have to know what happens in the mind. And I have found in an article that I read that the past and the future only exist in the mind. And this means that we can be aware of what has happened in the past, and we can think of the possibilities of the future, but we can never fully focus on either of them because a part of us will always be in the present. So it's healthy to be aware of the past and the future, but it's important to focus on what's happening in the here and now so that we can fully fulfill the capacity of every moment that we have. But the interesting thing that I found in another article um, called Death um, is that the capacity to live and actually living are two different things. The capacity to live is an opportunity, a privilege that we have as living beings to be alive. Whereas living is a choice that we make on a daily basis, on a momentary basis, to take advantage of the moments we have. It is like a seed. The capacity to live is like a seed. And if we leave it on the shelf and never plant that seed, never do anything with that seed, if we just let the moments pass by, that seed will come to nothing. But if we water it and we nurture it, that seed can grow and spread um, into something bigger and something greater. And by being aware of our time, we can also understand ourselves better and other people better, which is why um, being aware of time establishes identity. I read a poem by Walt Whitman called The Song of Myself. And in this poem, Walt Whitman describes all these things that he has, material things, money, fame, fortune, anything you could want, he has it. And yet at the end of all that, he says, these are not the me myself. You see, Whitman didn't define himself by the nouns in his life because his identity wasn't found in a noun, but rather a verb to be. He later describes uh, his mannerisms in the setting, and he uses verbs that aren't very significant, waiting, watching, wondering, and these verbs only show that he is in tune with himself and with the world around him. But just because our identity, when we are aware of time, can be found in a verb does not mean that we are defined by the doings and the happenings of our past. Because if that were true, that means that I could define myself by my heart condition, which is something I've actually struggled with for a very long time. Going into high school for the first year and a half, I didn't want anybody to know that I had a heart condition because I didn't want to be known as the sick kid anymore. I did not want to be defined by it. And I am not the only one who has felt like this. I read a book by John Green called The Fault in Our Stars, and it's about cancer patients. And in, there's this one scene where a character named Augustus is talking to the main character, Hazel, and he says, Hazel, tell me your story. And for the second time, she begins to tell him her cancer story. 
And he, sa he stops her and he says, no, Hazel, I don't want to hear your cancer story. I've already heard it. I want to hear your story. Because he understood that your story is not defined, that Hazel was not defined by what had happened to her, but rather what she did in life despite this thing happening to her. And that is how, um, that's the beauty of living in the moment, is realizing that every new moment is a chance to do something different, to do something new, to change if you want or need to. And, um, oh, it reminds me of another character that I read from a book called Tuesdays with Maury. You see, he saw life uh, in, a, in a similar perspective of um, rather than, um, rather than why, why, why do all this um, if you're just going to die anyway, he posed the question of, well, if you're going to die anyway, why not live while you can? Um, and the only way that he really said to do this was through love. And that's why he says that love is the only rational act. You see, Maury saw love as this, this thing that connects people together because love is something that lasts beyond time. It's the only thing that we can do to defy time. Time is this great entity that binds us and that rules over us. And the only way to escape it is to do something that lasts beyond that. And that is through love. And because we can be aware of our time, um, Maury says that we, can, we have the opportunity to love. In fact, he suggests that we have the obligation to love. And that is why being aware of time establishes morality. Um, he says that it's not, the, it's not the negative that you know you're going to die, but rather the positive. It's not the negative that you're going to die, but the positive that you know you're going to die, and you live a better life because of it. And to and to do that, you need love. And with love comes connection, which is why being aware of time establishes connection. Love reminds me quite much like a fountain, because when one person loves another person, that love is inspiring, and it spreads to other people, and it fills up and becomes this cascade, this, this um, this chain reaction, just like a fountain. And um, the overflow of love reminds the living to keep being aware of time, and it keeps the dead alive through the inspiration of love that they have shown us when they were alive. And that is why those who we love never truly leave us, because they live on in our hearts and in our memories um, through the love that they have inspired within us. Um, so, if we are aware of time, we can choose to love with the life and the time that we are given. Living for the moment, it's not something that requires a drastic change in life. It's the small things for the most part. For some, it could be leaving your phone in your pocket during a face-to-face -face conversation. For others, it could be not to stress so much over the future. For my brother, it was taking a week off to visit his dying sister. And as for me, well, it's here giving this talk, stepping out of my comfort zone, taking full advantage of this opportunity, of this moment. Thank you. <laughs>